Good afternoon. If some folks are come to these before, one more time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. If we haven't met yet, I'm your council member, Ben Kalos. I have the privilege of representing the Upper East Side, Sutton, El Barrio, and Roosevelt Island. Thank you to the elected officials and their representatives who have joined us. Most importantly, thank you to those in the audience who came out today. Thank you. The State of the District is a report on all that we've accomplished over the past three years, 21 days, 13 hours, and 34 minutes and five seconds, and a chance to look ahead at our future. As if this is your first time, you don't have to wait for the State of the District. I want to meet all 168,413 people who I represent in order to better serve you. You can join me in person on the first Friday of every month from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. to have a conversation with neighbors or for a brainstorm with Ben on the second Tuesday of every month at 6 p.m. for a policy discussion and organizing. We have mobile hours at senior centers, free legal clinics in our district office on housing, family law, domestic violence, land use, landmarking, and even life planning. Each evening, I or my staff attend community board, precinct council, neighborhood association, and tenants association meetings. Over the warmer months, you'll find us at street fairs or cooking with Kalos at green markets. And don't forget to stop by our fresh food box for farm to table produce for just $12. But you don't have to come to us. I will come to you for Ben in your building. Just gather 10 neighbors in your home, your lobby, or at your annual meeting or board meeting. Yes, I make house calls. Each month we hold public meetings from town halls to special events focusing on environment, tenants' rights, or senior health. These events rely on community partnerships like our emergency preparedness trainings, which we do with our local community emergency response teams on Roosevelt Island and the Upper East Side. Thank you to our CERT leaders, Howard Pallavi and Christine Donovan, for their partnership and all they do every time there's an emergency. We're here to help. We can work with you on issues related to seniors, housing, jobs, families, finances, nutrition, and especially getting your through one complaints resolved. When you're in need, getting government to work for you should be as easy as turning on your faucet in your kitchen sink. I've introduced automatic benefits legislation to cut through the bureaucracy and get your benefits automatically. We've launched a benefit screening tool in partnership with Intuit and the federal government, which we've released nationwide. But in the meantime, to borrow from GEICO, 25 minutes or less could screen you for 25 or more government benefits. My constituent services team, led by Debbie Lightbody with the support of Tirsa Tavares and more than a dozen graduate students in social work, as well as many of our undergraduate interns, has helped more than 5,000 constituents to stay in their homes, renew their SNAP benefits, or get that pothole outside their bedroom window fixed. This was quite the year. Here on a local level, a lot of it was actually good, so let's review. Just like the law and order, we will share stories ripped from the headlines of the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and NBC News about the fights we've taken on as a community, where we've won, and where we continue to fight on. We fought special interests, interests greedy landlords, overdevelopment and displacement, the Marine Transfer Station. We've invested in education, expanded our transportation, opened new parks, and so much more. When I ran for office, I promised to work for you full time without taking money on the side from private employment as a lawyer. I also promised to work for you, not the Speaker of the City Council, for going the common practice of receiving tens of thousands in personal income, called a Lulu, for being a committee chair, which the Daily News long called legal bribery. So I kept my pledge and I wrote the law that made outside income and Lulu's illegal so that all city elected officials would work exclusively for their constituents. I'd like to thank my wife for clapping. 
New York City's campaign finance system matches every dollar you give with $6 from the government up to $175 to empower the small do dollars of residents over special interests. But lobbyists were bundling small contributions to help candidates get matching dollars without going through the residents themselves, only strengthening special interests. I wrote the law that stopped that match so public dollars will only amplify your voices. While we were at it, we closed the campaign for one New York loophole that allowed elected officials to take tens of thousands of dollars from special interests and spend it on advertisements to support themselves in office. Elected officials that control nonprofits will have to disclose their donors who will be limited to doing business contribution limits of $400. In the wake of the unlawful purge of hundreds of thousands of voters at the Board of Elections before the presidential primary, I wrote a law to create a voter information portal so voters can track absentee ballots, find poll sites, view ballots, and verify registration status and whether their votes were counted. Following outrage after a deed restriction was lifted, allowing a nursing home on Rivington Street to become luxury housing, I viewed records and held a hearing so that New Yorkers could finally learn what happened on the record and under oath. Yeah. I then worked with Borough President Gail Brewer and Council Member Chin to pass a law to prevent it from happening again. Fiscal responsibility requires saving in good times to get us through the bad, since I was elected, I've advocated for the city to save more money to get us through the next economic downturn. And in response, the city increased its reserves to an estimated $8.76 billion. Fiscal responsibility also means watching your budget for escalating costs. When I noticed the city's lawsuit payouts were escalating to over a billion dollars a year, I was able to pressure the law department to reduce planned lawsuit payouts by $430 million over the next five years. But with a budget of $82 billion, it can be hard to monitor how our taxpayer dollars are being spent, especially when the budget is only available in print or PDF. So I introduced legislation to put New York City's budget online, and shortly thereafter, the Office of Management and Budget did it. Please take a look at the city's budget and let me know if you notice where anywhere we can save money. After all, it's your money. The city can and must do more to fight overdevelopment and the march of super scrapers across 57th Street and into residential neighborhoods. In April of 2015, Dieter Selig brought a planned 1,000-foot tower to my attention as children were collecting Easter eggs at the annual Sutton Area Community Hunt. We sprang into action, bringing hundreds of neighbors to Community Board 6, which passed a resolution within 45 days calling on city planning to cap heights of the mid-blocks between First and Sutton, just like in the rest of the neighborhood. But we didn't wait for city planning to do it for us because we'd still be waiting. So Dieter Seelig and I began meeting with buildings throughout Sutton, and we were soon joined by Alan Kirsch to raise money for community-led rezoning. We launched the East River's 50s Alliance, led by Alan Kirsch, Robert Schepler, Lisa Mercurio, Jessica Osborne, and the Leadership Committee with elected officials, organizations, over 35 buildings, and more than 400 individual members. With local heroes, we've been winning the fight. When Herndon Worth, the sage of Sutton, who grew up here, was offered a buyout offer, he refused to sell out the community and abandon his home of 40 years. He stopped the developer from acquiring 434 East 58th Street, a crucial fourth building that the developer was saying he already owned. <laughs> Charles Fernandez, a retired security guard who has lived here with his family for decades, has also refused numerous buyout offers. 
he began facing harassment, receiving a letter saying construction workers would be entering his home to cut holes in the ceiling and the walls, leaving him exposed to the elements through the cold winter months. He reached out on a weekend, and by that Monday, the Department of Buildings had blocked the demolition work because of errors, omission, and their failure to have a legally required plan to protect tenants. Last month, IRFA, Borough President Brewer, Senator Kruger, Councilmember Grodnick, and I finally filed an application to rezone the neighborhood, capping buildings at 210 feet or 260 feet if they include affordable housing on site. Please join the fight at irfa.nyc slash donate. You can do it now on your mobile phones. <laughs> Seriously. Just as we made progress in Sutton, a skyscraper, the tallest north of Trump Plaza popped up at 180 East 88th Street. And just as they were pouring the foundation, the Carnegie Hill neighbors came to the rescue led by President Lowe Vanderbach and expert urban planner George Janes. We worked together and found that they had created a loophole in the form of a tiny four-foot lot that would allow them to build much taller than normally allowed. You can see it there on that little red line on that slide. We wrote a letter with Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer and got a stop work order that was in place for months. Thanks to the vigilance of Senator Liz Kruger, we noticed when a new plan was filed with a still unbuildable 10-foot lot and together we filed a zoning challenge. Though the city is letting the developer build, the challenge stands and if the city does not do the right thing, we will go to court. You can join that fight at Carnegie Hill Neighbors. <laughs> the zoning law was created to stop tall buildings like the 40-story equitable building. If we want to stop every building on the Upper East Side from being 400 feet and taller, please support Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts who work every day to protect our neighborhood's character. With all this construction, New York City has nearly 9,000 scaffolds that cover nearly 200 miles of the city sidewalks. Scaffolding is supposed to be temporary to protect the public from falling bricks or construction. However, when I met residents like Robert Feiner and Warren Ye at Ben and Your Buildings, they complained of scaffolds that went up and never came down because it was cheaper for neighboring buildings to leave them up than fix the underlying problems. Jane Foss lives in a building where her landlord is trying to use scaffolding that's been up for years to force her and other tenants out. In response, I've introduced legislation with timelines so that when scaffolding goes up, the work gets done and goes back down, or the city steps in, does the work, and makes bad landlords pay. When the mayor proposed a citywide zoning change, mandatory inclusionary housing and zoning for quality and affordability, in partnership with Manhattan Borough President and our community boards, we fought to make sure it worked for our neighborhoods and won. We kept our mid blocks at 75 feet, reduced the height increase at 86, 79th, 72nd from 50 feet to 25 feet for a maximum of 235 feet, we protected the sliver law, which prevents towers narrower than 40 feet wide. We added options for half of New York City residents who earn less than $33,000 a year, and we required HPD to actually track, register, and monitor new affordable housing. If you're one of the one million New Yorkers who lives in rent-stabilized housing, you know that the Rent Guidelines Board votes on how much your rent goes up each year. So we fought for tenants each year, leading the city council with letters and testimony. After a generation of always seeing the rent go up, even when inflation went down, we won the lowest rent increase, rent increase ever our first year and first ever rent freezes for the next two years. Whether or not you're in rent-stabilized housing, if you've been to housing court, you're on the tenant blacklist. Margo Miller ended up in housing court and won her case, then agreed to move out.
But when she tried to rent a new apartment, tenant screening companies reported that she'd been in housing court and no one would rent to her, leaving her out on the street. Nobody should be discriminated against for exercising their right to go to court. In response to what happened to Margaret and hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers like her, I, we worked with State Senator Liz Krueger and tenant lawyer Jamie Fishman to propose legislation to license tenant screening companies, forcing them to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The city's homelessness continues to rise to over 60,250 as of this week. But why can't they just go get a job? Well, 23,456 of those homeless are children. 23,456 children woke up in a shelter and went to public schools with our children, grandchildren, friends, and neighbors. 17,858 are their family members. 3,790 are single women, and 9,858 are single men in our shelters with more than 2,794 people on our streets. In 2015, we saw an increase in the city's homelessness, and we began organizing the Eastside Task Force for Homeless Outreach and Services, launched in 2016 to bring elected officials, city agencies, nonprofit, and faith-based providers to the table to ensure they have support in helping our city's neediest. Please take a moment now to download the 311 app. If you see someone in need, take 30 seconds to use the 311 app to dispatch homeless assistance. The city will offer them three meals a day, free medical, mental health, or substance abuse care, shelter, including rent vouchers, and even free job training. 311 will let you know the result of their outreach. Even if the person refuses, which they likely will, if you keep calling, each interaction helps to build a relationship that gets them closer to saying yes to our help. The mayor continues to build the Marine Transfer Station, a project that started with its approval in 2006. We've been able to delay its opening for another four years and continue the fight every day. We've gained many concessions, including moving the ramp to 92nd Street, limiting use to only one third of capacity to keep 300 garbage trucks off our streets each day, and as promised during my campaign with my advocacy for zero, zero waste, to make this landfill dump obsolete, the city has set a goal of zero waste by 2030. Along those lines, we can reduce 7,500 garbage truck trips a year through reusable bags. We've given away over 500 with another 200 today as we prepare for single-use plastic bag reduction bill that will go into effect on February 15th. We do all this because we do not inherit the earth from our parents. We borrow it from our children in whom we must invest and educate. I believe in a world class public education that starts with universal pre kindergarten for all. I was proud to campaign alongside the mayor for this, but was disappointed when in 2014, my district had 123 seats to serve an estimated 2,100 four-year-olds. When Ava Besbach and Susie Del Campo of the Roosevelt Island Parents Network reached out, we immediately worked with PSIS 217 Principal Mondana Beckman to double the number of pre-kindergarten seats. With more seats in hand, but still not enough, we assessed the need by collecting a list of three-year-olds on Roosevelt Island to prove to the Department of Education that there was a need. We worked with Pamela Stark at the Roosevelt Island Day Nursery through the bureaucratic application process, and there was one, when there was one last hoop we couldn't clear alone, Susan Rosenthal, president of the Roosevelt Island Operating Corporation, stepped in to secure the space we needed for 54 four-year-olds. We built a model and replicated it with Ariel Chesler and Jack Moran at PS183, where Principal Tara Napoleone opened more seats. I will continue to pressure the mayor and Chancellor Farina to make sure every child in my district has a seat in the neighborhood 
because right now we have pre-K for some, but not for all. But the, <laughs> but the best thing we can do is find vacant first and second floor commercial spaces or private providers with whom we can partner to open more seats in the district. Once in school, children shouldn't have to worry about where their next meal is coming from. Children should be able to focus on learning. That's why I advocated for and won free school lunch for all middle schools and continue to push for free lunch for all 1.1 million public school students. While some might cut funding to the arts, I believe in supporting them with their annual art show at the world famous Sotheby's. Thank you to Patricia Corrigy, the president of the PTA at PS183, who helped get the art show back off the ground, Principal Tara Napoleone and art teacher Juan Ling Farrer for organizing and seeing the event through, and of course, to the hundreds of children whose art we hang at Sotheby's each year. Arts are part of our investment in STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Green roofs and technology have been the top vote getters in participatory budgeting, where residents over 14 vote on how to spend discretionary capital dollars from my office. So together, we've invested 3.1 million in green roofs and 3.8 million in computers, smart boards, and science labs. Please, yeah. Please become a delegate in order to decide what goes on the ballot and help secure $1 million for an improvement in the neighborhood. We must also make sure it is safe for our children and adults to get around our neighborhood. Drivers, riders, bikers, and walkers must all have a space on the street so we may share it safely. With the launch of Vision Zero, we held forums, surveyed 60,000 households to identify dangerous intersections, compiling responses into a livable streets report. The Department of Transportation's Manhattan Pedestrian Safety Plan prioritized seven of our most dangerous intersections for improvement. Please continue to report dangerous intersections and corners to my office so we can all have livable streets. Pedestrians are afraid of being hit and hurt or killed by a bike or a car, and cyclists are also afraid of the same. We launched a bike safety program on expanding it from my district to the entire Upper East Side and Midtown East this year with Councilmember Gorodnik. We're using education, equipment, and enforcement to make our streets safer, all the way from East 30th to East 96th Street, training residents at bike shops and monthly classes in my office with a free month on city bike membership for those who attend. We're also training commercial bikes in English, Spanish, and Chinese with free safety vests so we can identify who is and isn't obeying the laws. Our next training is this Thursday, January 26th, from 2.30 to 5 p.m. at RFK School. Please make sure your favorite restaurant gets the training. I've asked everyone who's hosted a Ben in Your Building to ban commercial cyclists from delivering food on electric bikes or without vests, which is the same way we eliminated menus from being slid under our doors. I want to thank the East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association led by Valerie Mason and Liz Patrick for beginning the process by grading restaurants on their use of safety vests and electric bikes. With the continued help of all of our partners, especially the 17th and 19th precincts, we've seen results in 2016. 17,615 moving violations issued to motor vehicles. 1,865 summonses issued to bicycle riders, a ninefold increase from last year, and the seizure of 70 illegal electric bikes. We will continue to do more, but please go to the 19th Precinct on the first Monday of every month at 7 p.m. to thank Commanding Officer McPherson for all the bike enforcement and express your support for more. Now, how many of you took a bus to get here this morning? In my district, we love our buses, but we want faster service and more of it. We want select bus service, which increases speeds by as much as 20% for the M86 
and now the M79 following my request, and we're studying it for more cross-town routes. Residents complain about poor service, but the MTA denies it. Using bus time, I can tell you where every single bus in the city of New York is at every moment of the day. We found that as many as 17.9% of buses in the district were showing up bunched, which is the equivalent of losing one in five buses on a route. I've requested the MTA share information from their fare box so we can see ridership for ourselves and to test our hypothesis that ridership declines with poor service and long delays. After residents near East 72nd Street, including my mother, complained about the loss of limited bus service, we worked with numerous volunteers from the East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association to collect over 2,700 signatures of residents who want select bus service reinstated at this stop, and you can add your name at bencalos.com. In response to the petition, I authored a letter with Senator Kruger, signed by our elected officials in October. At the January meeting of CB8, the MTA declined to add the stop as requested and erroneously stated they had advised elected officials. The following week, we received the letter they had claimed to send. In the letter, they blamed low ridership, but to this day, they refused to share the fare box information. And so we fight for transparency and the restoration of this stop. After decades without a franchise agreement to protect the iconic and indispensable Roosevelt Island tram, especially on weekends when the F train doesn't always run, I'm proud to have passed authorization to the City Council through 2068. We've also brought ferry service to Roosevelt Island starting later this year and the east side next year. <laughs> Congress Member Carol Maloney has been ever vigilant in pushing to get the Second Avenue subway completed on time and I've been proud to join in her fight. Thanks to Governor Cuomo, MTA Chair Prendergrass, and Dr. Michael Rodnishanu of the MTA Capital Construction, we opened the Second Avenue subway on New Year's Eve. For a more connected commute, free Wi-Fi has been expanded from 86th Street and the 456, where we opened it 2015, to every subway station in the system. Improving commutes is one thing, but we still need open space to play or relax. My council district ranks fourth from the bottom for park space per capita according to New Yorkers for Parks, and it's only getting worse with new construction. As chair of the East River Esplanade Task Force with Congressmember Maloney, I've secured $47 million in public and private funds for the Esplanade with more to come. Working with Jennifer Ratner, founder of the Friends of the East River Esplanade, Senator Serrano and Assemblymember Rodriguez, we identified several locations along the runoff waterfront to activate for the public. Working with the Department of Transportation, the Parks Department, and friends, I was proud to add more than 3,000 square feet of park space by opening the 90th Street Pier to the public. When we figured out that the lease for the one and a quarter acre Queensboro Oval under the 59th Street Bridge at York would finally be up after more than a generation as a private tennis club, Community Board 8 Parks Committee Chairs, Peggy Price and Susan Evans, and I got together with one goal in mind. Open the Oval. We launched a petition. Peggy and Susan organized a rally and we've been working with the Parks Department ever since. Please join us by signing the petition. Thank you to the leaders in the community. Thank you to those who signed petitions, who came out to meeting after meeting, who made your voice heard in government, because a democracy by the people, for the people, only works when the people are involved. Thank you to my staff, graduate students in social work, undergraduate fellows and interns who help residents every day. As you can see, we've come a long way in just three years, but none of it happened through one person. None of it happened on its own. We've done so much because of those of you who stood up to the challenge to get involved, to make change, because together 
we can do anything. I have 11 months, 8 days, 9 hours, sorry, 8 hours and uh, 56 minutes and 13 seconds left in my first term as your council member. Although I have every intention of staying on the job, a second term cannot be taken for granted. Let's make every second count.